Hello everyone and welcome to our last day of special speciality. Um, I am sad to be on the final day, but happy that everything happened. So um, uh, very welcome, very warm welcome to everyone. So if you haven't joined us uh, before during this week, uh, this is uh, one of the sessions of special speciality. Uh, this is a multidisciplinary conference aimed at discussing the concept of space, distance and shape across science and art. Um, and so we have today uh, to open our final day. Uh, Maximilian Sitt. Max is currently a professor of cultural data analytics at the University in Estonia, working within multidisciplinary collaborations towards a systematic understanding of art and culture via a combination of qualitative inquiry, quantitative measurement, aesthetics and computation. Max, Max's work is not only a great example of genuine interdisciplinarity, but it's also, it also neighbors artistic disciplines. And so he's a double ideal match for this 10th event, where we tried to feature artistic creation more prominently and address the parallels between art and science. Max was an eager participant in Numerous Numerosity last year and has been an enthusiastic supporter of SENF of since, since for, for which we greatly appreciate. Uh, and thank you. Um, following our interaction last year in, in the conference, Max and I have begun also scientific collaboration in the study of higher order networks and mathematical modeling of complex systems. The reason why I'm telling you this right now is that I believe that this kind of uh, interaction is a good example of the sort of networking opportunities that SEMF aspires to create. Um, two individuals with very different training and backgrounds, uh, different degrees of academic seniority coming together to collaborate on one concrete transversal question. Max. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I, I first like to say that this is really fantastic. The whole conference, the conference that happened before, true multidisciplinarity, as it is sometimes called behind closed door as a kind of a derogatory term, is something that is exceedingly rare. And uh, so this group of people uh, sort of nurturing that, uh, I think, is, is a really, really fantastic kind of thing. And uh, anybody who has followed the talks in the last couple of days knows that the full bandwidth uh, of things is stuff you typically don't see together. And the togetherness is really not only possible, but also necessary to actually make progress. And uh, so I try to um, sort of... Um, stand in that tradition and follow up on uh, what has been said. And now I have to get the Zoom window out of the way here. So I actually can see my own slides. Um, so can you see the slides? Yes, very good. So basically, um, I, I try to follow up uh, um, to what happened uh, throughout the week. And you will see that obviously there's lots of material which is uh, at the same time different, but also ties in with many aspects. And so I added a bunch of material, which sort of, um, I think, will provide interesting sort of like um, points of discussion. But in general, this talk is split into multiple parts, which uh, are um, trying to characterize different types of spaces. And in particular, there is a twofold thing going on. One is obviously the space that, you know, three-dimensional space that surrounds us. And the other thing is conceptual meaning spaces, which can be both topological like networks and at the same time uh, can also be multidimensional vector spaces and stuff like that. Um, and so I will give you examples. This is not in any case sort of uh, the final answer or the most general thing, but I think it needs to be exemplified that these kind of things uh, do exist in cultural uh, science slash um, uh, culture as a subject of research and as such uh, warrant to be studied. So cultural meaning spaces and cultural data analytics. Um, I will start with similarity space, um, AKA uh, polymorphic visual family resemblance. Uh, the last two words are Wittgensteinian. Visual was something brought in by Eleanor Roche. And polymorphic means there is no such thing as simple description of an image. Typically, there's many, many different ways that come together. And so this thing is sort of an old um, uh, thing. Um, in archaeology, for example, people do pictures like the one in the center below, which is a similarity field of, you know, pots and vases, both uh, existing and um, um, and, you know, out of fantasy. Um, and so this picture was actually printed by Rupert Riedel, uh, who's an evolutionary biologist in a book called Structures of Complexity. 
And one of the interesting things he says is there is no such thing as discrete engrams um, in culture and art. And so basically you have this kind of landscape of things that are more or less discrete, but often less discrete. Nevertheless, uh, you find things uh, like this. Oops, sorry. Um, you find things like this. Uh, where it's very clear that there's a sort of common type going on. So this is what Abe Warburg in the 1920s called uh, a pathos formula. So basically some configuration of human body pose that has some meaning and uh, transports a lot of loaded, in this case, theologic, either positive or negative uh, theology. Um, Obviously, this thing uh, is so interesting that people have started uh, trying to make sense of it systematically. To the left, you see a plate of one of the 72 plates of Abi Warburg's Memnusuna Atlas, where he tried to sort of like put together all these um, figures um, that are basically looking similar, having um, different and um, different meanings and different forms, same form, different meanings, same meaning, different forms, um, trying to figure out how this polymorphic family resemblance things work. Um, he literally went, quote unquote, nuts over it. So he uh, lost his distance in his own word uh, and went to the sanatorium until uh, Ernst Cassira sort of like, you know, sort of like let him know that he was actually writing up to something. And then they started this project, among others, uh, to make sense of this kind of, um, you know, sort of like what we now call polymorphic family resemblance. To the right, you see a random, not so random uh, Pinterest board, which obviously is now one way where crowdsourcing and algorithmic and similarity matching sort of like leads to this Pinterest boards where you can also see these kind of uh, resemblances. In the upper left corner, you see the Nika of Samatraka and Beyonce wearing a dress that sort of like puts her in the same realm. And so basically that kind of thing is something we have going on all over the place. Now, this is a hard problem. Here is five pictures of the same ruin. And uh, I would assume if you're not trained in seeing this particular ruin from different sides, it's probably pretty hard to make sense that it is the same ruin. Um, um, an easier example is the rheology of cats, um, you know, polymorphic catology, so to speak, um, conformal catology <laughs> uh, to be in the spirit of yesterday. Um, this is something which is obviously very, very hard if you do it in a sort of like, you know, sort of like very stereotypical uh, way. But at the same time, we all know as humans, it's really easy to, start to recognize cats. Like even the cat in a bowl is really easy to recognize for humans. So how does this work? So nowadays we have actually made lots of progress, particularly in the last 10 years, with this thing called convolutional neural networks, a method from the 80s, merging with lots and lots and lots of data, lots and lots and lots of energy, having lots of layers in a neural network. So this is sort of the connectionist um, implementation. Um, you feed an image to that neural network, which is trained with many, many images. And as an output, you get some kind of vector, or you know, you could map some label to that, but typically it's a vector. And obviously, if you want to have the distance between two images, you get the distance between the two vectors. Uh, you could take this um, set of vectors and actually sort of like you know do some dimensionality reduction, and then you get a picture like this. Um, whoops. Uh, you get a picture like this. This is a T SNE plot of uh, all of the images in WikiArt. Um, so 150,000 images. And the neat thing about this, if you zoom in, is that this is again a similarity field like Rupert Riedel's. And so this is contiguous areas in this TSNE plot, and you can see they make a lot of sense. So there is really similar images are clustering together. Actually, let me go back to this picture here. We decided it would make sense because polymorphic family resemblance, right? Polymorphic, uh, to actually put some sunglasses in front of the neural network. Alternatively, you could actually weight the network internally, but let's be really blunt and put sunglasses in front of it. Let's only give the neural network, the same neural network with the same standard training uh, contoured images. Uh, so the contours of the image are only the color information, like basically colors sorted as a strip, which you can see um, here um, in three versions. And in the lower right corner, you can see how this would look when you give the image basically at the, the neural network. And then you can actually go on and um, sort of like filter the whole thing. So here you see, again, a TSNE plot of a smaller collection of um, uh, that is sort of the result of giving the neural network just the contour. And as you can see, 
this guy with the uh, blue jacket um, is actually sort of like clustered with the portraits, which makes sense. Uh, but I could do the same thing and basically tell the neural network just the color information. And then this happens, uh, the blue guy is clustered with images that you really would like to have together in a living room. Um, if you're an interior designer, this is probably uh, something that either makes you very afraid or uh, you may think, oh, that's a really good tool to sell to people sort of similar images, which otherwise have nothing to do with each other, but really fit well together in terms of chromaticity. So in, in, in very short, we could say uh, we have now cracked connoisseurship. So there is now machines who are just as good in clustering similar images together, by the extension, you could say spotting what is a Caravaggio, uh, then human connoisseurs or you know, human radiologists. Um, we all hear these news, you know, there's a neural network that is better in recognizing breast cancer or you know, skin cancer than uh, sort of a human practitioner. This is exactly what's going on here. But one key issue that we haven't solved yet is we typically don't know what's going on between stimulus and response. These ne neural networks are super, super complicated and obviously are now a subject of study themselves. So we have to engage in some kind of, uh, you could say, artificial neural science. And so this is what sort of led us to an idea that we really would like to actually come up with a kind of explainable similarity space, because this would allow us to actually sort of make sense of um, both what humans think and um, sort of what um, neural networks do, for example, right? So can we fix, in other words, the dimensions and actually make this space sort of a measurable space, even though it may be multidimensional? And so there is a paper that dropped, uh, the preprint dropped on, um, so as we submitted it last Friday, uh, we sent out the tweet, uh, I think, 10 minutes before the start of this conference. Um, and this is a lucky coincidence, um, I have to say, but um, it is um, a very, very fitting coincidence. So this is now an archive. Um, Andres Karius is a senior fellow in, in the Kudan group who did most of the heavy lifting uh, for the implementation of the research and also did a lot of progress there. Uh, Mark Anitzula and Tilman Ulm are both artists in our group, but also researchers uh, who helped. And two, two PI authors are Sebastian Honored and myself. And so my sort of like background is more this polymorphic family resemblance, and you will see later image classification art history and stuff like that. While Sebastian Honored is a, um, uh, is a complexity, uh, complex system scientist, network scientist. Uh, with also very, very multidisciplinary background. And he had a really unbelievably cool idea. So there is for a long while um, the notion that paintings or artworks in general are sort of the algorithmic products uh, from say the palette with unmixed colors to the canvas. Okay, so Max Benz is sort of like um, um, uh, came up with this idea together with the ideas of quantitative uh, aesthetics of Birkhoff, uh, Rigaud and so on. You can actually bring this together and I basically have this idea of saying, okay, <clears throat> if the painting is the product of some algorithm, which may be very general, may be very complicated, but nevertheless, of an algorithm, you could imagine that uh, the artworks of an artist sort of follow more closely a similar algorithm than uh, of two different artists. And now one of the interesting things is that if you uh, think about it in this way, you can assume that uh, the, uh, the image or the algorithm is stable under transformation. So if we transform the image in many, many different ways, um, images that have the same algorithm would stay closer together in space than um, in other way. And how do we measure this transformation? Basically, what we um, the simplest way is to do um, uh, compression length. So Kolmogorov complexity, which for which obviously some kind of um, Upper bound, we can we can basically just compress the file. So what you see here is a painting by Piet Mondrian, Windmill in the Gain, and um, you can see this is a meter by meter twenty six. Um, there's lots of stuff happening on this painting. You will probably have a very hard time describing everything that is going on, um, you know, other than it's a windmill in a landscape with a horizon and stuff like that. So that looking at this painting, the sort of like 
a symbolic description of it or you know feature recognition object like uh, description of it is sort of simple but there is lots of stuff going on and so here is how we capture this we transform the images in our case in 112 ways this is only half of them and uh, then compress them and so above every little image here every the one in the upper left is a transform is is the raw image uh, and then everything else is a transformation from, uh, you know, basically blurring to Fourier transform. Um, you basically um, transform and then you compress and in the upper right corner, you can see this number C, which is the compression ratio of sort of the, comp uh, the, the transformed and compressed version divided by uh, sort of the original file size. And so as you do this, obviously what you get is um, a vector. Uh, here it's this vertical thing where the arrow points. Uh, of this part, like every column in this matrix is a painting by Mondrian in this case. Um, and obviously you get some over and under expression uh, of like how large and how small this uh, whole thing is. So some value of the sort of like compression ratio. And you can do this for every painting. So here the X axis in this matrix is time. The Y axis is actually the, um, um, the uh, compression, uh, transformations and compressions. And you can see to the right, we've clustered this. So you can see there is some transformations that do line and shape clarity, others do color complexity, and others do sort of like detail compressibility, like basically how many objects are in there and stuff like that. And if you look at that matrix and you go from left to right, you can clearly see uh, there is something happening uh, about two thirds into this. So the, 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 the shape of this matrix fundamentally changes. So if this was a biology paper, we'd make it to PNAS, right? And so basically there is some really interesting stuff going on here. Now, obviously we cannot only do this for one painter, but we can do it for everybody. Um, and we can do it for very large uh, sets of images. And we can do the very same thing that we have done with the machine learning, use uh, dimensionality reduction such as TSNE or PCA or um, UMAP and draw a similarity field. And so here's just to show that this works. So here's a UMAP, uh, which is basically some sort of, um, you know, it's related to sort of like spring embedded network layout uh, over the distances. Um, so you can see that this makes some sort of sense. So here, every pixel is a painting and every painting uh, is reduced to sort of its dominant color. And uh, the callouts tell you that, uh, you know, the images in the vicinity of the callout point uh, are truly similar. So they're, they're, it, it really works. So now I want to emphasize that this is not machine learning. This is, this is simple transformation. And I feel like we literally went down the list of image magic transformations. Um, of course, we picked uh, the ones that, you know, there are similar ones and whatever. So there's some, you, 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 at some point you decide what you do and what you don't do. But, you know, in general, you can do arbitrary transformations and then you do this kind of compression and then you do this kind of embedding. So we arrive at the same goal without any network training, without any sort of super complicated uh, 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 training and computation. And in particular, we don't need to do something like a comparison of images such as uh, you know, uh, normalized compression distance where you have pairwise comparison of every image over every other image. But every image is just embedded once. Okay, so you get this UMAP, which is a similarity field. And now um, here is uh, sort of the, 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 the super magic that can happen. Um, now we're at the same point as we are with the machine learning, but there is one difference. Um, we can use the similarity field as a kind of reference topography. So it's a little bit like, okay, so there's no geography of artworks, um, but we want to use our grid cells, so to speak. So we actually just put the UMAP there. And then we're going to map all the other uh, um, transformation dimensions uh, to versions of this UMAP. And so basically we make a heat map out of it, um, which, you know, obviously we could do it in different ways. But here, every single one of these pictures you see, of these uh, plots you see, is a heat map version of the UMAP you see in the uh, upper left corner. So basically, every painting would appear in the same coordinate it appears in the UMAP. But then we take the average in every sort of cell or region of the heat map um, of the particular transformation measure. So raw compression, blur, and so on. And if you stare at this picture, what you can see is indeed it makes sense to do it in this multidimensional way because they all look different. 
So this is a really interesting notion, right? So while at the same time, the UMAP makes sense as a similarity field, you can see there's huge variation over this compression parameters. And basically every additional compression parameter allows you to sort of lock in uh, sort of artworks in some sort of algorithmic way. And um, I'd like to emphasize that this here is sort of a really simplified version of the whole thing, because there is these uh, plots that appear mostly gray. Now imagine at any given cell of this plot, um, um, the images that are in that particular cell could all be close to the average, or they could just cancel each other out, but actually uh, sort of um, span the entire parameter space. And that is a really interesting thing because this is subject to future study because you can imagine, like for example, you're an artist and you want to get close to sort of depicting the human body in a naturalistic way, like, you know, like sculptors in ancient Greece or painters working up to Raphael. Now, one of the key things, once you reach that point, the question is like, how stable is that point? Would you go further? Um, you know, are you driven further, or are you? Do you have drive to go further and stuff like that? And here we can actually take a look if the artworks that coincide in a particular locations actually what are what is the sort of like bandwidth of where you're going? So basically, we can now study this space because we have this sort of like um, multi-dimensional space with actual explainable dimensions. Because for every single one of these dimensions, we know exactly what it was doing. Okay. So now the question is, is this sort of liable? Okay, so obviously the first thing we did is this is, uh, if this is uh, cognitively plausible, um, and here there is data sets like multi-pic, uh, you know, triangle very simple, vulture picture seeming to be the most complex picture. So people in uh, six languages were asked uh, if, um, if these images are simple or complex. And based on that sort of norm, uh, we could test our algorithm and uh, basically uh, figure out that we're actually doing better than the variance between the languages. So, so this thing really seems to work and is cognitively plausible. Similarly for fractals, so there is the set of fractals which sort of uh, German speakers were exposed to and they had to sort of like, um, um, you know, um, point out if they're more simple as the one, the spiral to the left or more complex as the one on the right. And so this seems to work too. Second evaluation we took was to actually ask, okay, can we, um, sort of um, predict metadata categories with this sort of non-metadata thing. So we have, we were talking about quantitative aesthetics here, right? So it's the content of the actual, the pixel content of the, of the images. And so um, obviously it should make sense in terms of, uh, you know, predicting authors, um, dates, style periods, medium, genre, and so on. So as a, as a, this actually also works, uh, but just to give you an, uh, a sort of idea how hard this could be, um, on the top you see five example styles in our historical data set. We have two data sets. Uh, so far you have only seen the historical data sets at 75,000 paintings uh, spending a long period of time. And so here you see uh, the five centroid images of five art styles. Um, and um, I showed them, we showed them to you because, um, you know, if you, think about uh, prototypical examples of styles, typically the ones uh, that are really, really um, very, very different uh, are, are shown. But here you can see that sort of like in the large bulk mass, uh, yes, they look different, but there is actually some confusion going on, which is quite interesting. And at the bottom, the same thing is true for artists. You know, the, the first line or second line from top in general, um, George O'Keefe, obviously super recognizable, right? So you can even, one of the things when we did this thing with the color strips, even there, you know, you could uh, print a little uh, color strip and you would totally know it's George O'Keefe just by the gradient of colors. While the two uh, guys at the bottom, Lawrence and Romney, um, are a little bit more hard, right? It's, yeah, if you know them well, uh, you, you could probably separate them, but at particular, this ro low resolution, they're not that far apart uh, to, for, for an untrained eye to sort of like disambiguate uh, very clearly. So the, there, there's, there's some confusion. So we can never be perfect in this kind of thing, right? And so nevertheless, actually it works. So we use some very, very simple machine learning um, um, methods, a linear discriminant analysis and train a classifier uh, with 10, 100, 1,000 
um, of these examples. And then basically what you can see on the x-axis is taking into account more and more dimensions. And as you can see, the more dimensions of your transformations you take into account, the more your predictability actually goes up. Um, and that's not the only take home from this thing. The other take home is interesting, which is the list of top five transformations is different for different tasks. So to recognize artists and centuries, for example, uh, color luminance and embossing, for example, play a, a, a more prominent role than, for example, uh, for a landscape or portrait, for landscape, obviously, line. Um, so the contour basically separates the two. Uh, while drawing or oil painting, obviously it's the color um, that, that separates them. And one interesting thing is style periods versus centuries is sort of different, which is pretty interesting because they are functionally different also. Like, you know, centuries sort of like you have exponential growth over time, uh, while style periods typically are bucketized. So actually they fit in equally sized uh, museum departments. So you have 500 pictures in each building basically. At the bottom, you see the confusion between the art styles. And so unsurprisingly, Rococo and Baroque are uh, quite confused, while other things such as Art Nouveau uh, are sort of more singular. Um, and again, here, not only the classification makes sense, but also the confusion. And I say this for the stray computer scientists in the room, because uh, confusion is something which is not just something you should get rid of because of type one and type two errors, but um, in such systems, confusion is basically one of the most interesting things to know, which we want to basically analyze. So now this is sort of like now how it works and uh, what the, um, um, the evaluation of it is. But now what we're going to do with it, right? And so here we've done the following. Uh, so here you see the aesthetic dynamics of several hundred years of uh, painting uh, across a data set of 75,000 artworks, uh, which is the left two large plots. And uh, the first 175 days of the Hicket Nunc contemporary NFT art market, which started in March, 2021. And in the first 175 days, there were 85,000 artworks that were published and sold or not. So that is what you see on the right. You can uh, see a number of interesting differences, like unrelated to our method, the same thing, every dot is a sort of like dominant color reduction of a painting to one pixel. Um, obviously at the NFT, we only looked at static images. Uh, so now the interesting thing is there is a color difference. You can see on the right, uh, it's RGB color, which uh, feeds into the NFT data on the left. In the historical data, obviously, you're bounded by the pigments that are available. So preceding 1800, this is a little bit more brownish and dark than you can see. Um, and then from 1800 onwards, you have other pigments coming in, but there is a very clear different color space going on than RGB, um, both in terms of like um, what is possible, what's not possible mutually. Uh, now, in our method, so the top two plots uh, actually, um, what we did here is not like all the compressions, but we basically bundled them with principal component analysis. So there is a bunch of uh, correlating uh, transformations, which um, principal component one, which basically sum up the texture and detail complexity. And the bottom two large plots sum up to overall compressibility. So this is just a regular compression, basically, um, off the file. This is principal component number two. And what you can see on the left side in the historical data set is a very distinct broadening of the parameter space, particularly from 1800 onwards. And uh, so you can actually see there's a clear difference between sort of, you know, sort of more um, detailed realism, impressionism and sort of abstract art. There is a lot of like there's much more compressible stuff going on. While um, in the bottom plot, you can actually see there's huge difference between things around 1800, uh, you know, or like preceding 1800, where you get these rococo portraits, which are very smooth, not much detail, like long gradients and stuff like that. While um, in the 20th century, everything is possible, cubism, expressionism, surrealism, and so on. So parameter space, everything is all over the place. Now, if we move to the NFT stuff on the right, note that the Y axes are different, but actually if you would rescale the y-axis uh, on the left uh, to match the NFT data, you could actually see that you can read these plots from left to right, because the onset of the NFT data is actually very much um, in line with the historical artworks. 
And uh, you can see these vertical stripes, much like in the uh, historical data, this is basically data we lack. Like there's WikiArt, uh, which is sort of like the you know, original source of this data. Um, is sort of known to be underexpressed in the 18th century and the NFT uh, marketplace sort of had technical difficulties and all sorts of like scraping stuff. So you get these vertical lines basically. And so basically um, one of the interesting things is you have the same parameter space, but then something really, really interesting happens. About at day 100, there is this um, in, the, in the upper right plot, you see this like colorful things, like primary color things coming in. This is like not complex digital art as that would be in line with the mainstream of regular art, but this is actually a sort of CryptoPunk like avatar series, you know, this uh, Pokemon demo dudes, NFT people, sort of the Hicket Nunk equivalent of the sort of board ape kind of things that every one of us has seen by now, unfortunately. So one of the interesting things there is that they're completely out of the stream of sort of like regular stuff. And uh, one of the interesting things is that in the second um, principal component, they're actually sort of mainstream, but also more narrow. Uh, if you can see, there is a sort of narrowing going on. So the, the NFT market really looks different in the first hundred days than it looks in, looks in the follow-up. And one of the interesting things you can ask, obviously, because NFT data has this neat uh, uh, coincidence that you get all the data that art historians are hunting for hundreds of years, hundreds of years, uh, which is you get the artwork itself, the uh, metadata of the artwork, the creator, the creation date, the minting date, uh, the uh, sales, uh, you know who uh, sells it, you know who talks about it, and you know, uh, you know what the price was. So it, it's really sort of like, a, um, you know, it, it's like, it's like Twitter, the Twitter of, um, uh, of the art world. Basically, um, if you say Twitter is sort of like, like Twitter behaves to regular computational linguistics, right? There's plenty of works on Twitter and probably will have similar amount of works coming up on the NFT markets due to that sort of like perfection of like how much information you get. So if you look at these insets here at the bottom right corner, these are basically repetitions of um, the plot C and D uh, on the right side. Uh, only now the dots are not colored by the sort of dominant color of the artwork, but by do they sell red or do they not sell blue? So, and this is a heat map, obviously. So you can see if in a particular time in that particular um, PC dimension, something tends to sell or not. And you can see that these things that were introduced, these sort of like board ape-like uh, things, they don't sell, which is really interesting. So somebody sort of like uh, decided to move to an aesthetic space that is not yet beset is super simple in terms of like really compressible, but then sort of in higher order dimensions, like even a PC2, it's sort of like confused into the background, sort of like, you know, uh, uh, one could have a longer debate and further analysis of like how uninteresting this actually is. But one of the interesting things is they don't tend to sell. And we can actually sort of like do, for, we could do further analysis on this. There is one exception though, which I would like to point you to, which is around at, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer, but I move up and down here at the plot C upper right corner. You can see here at around day 120, there's after the gap here, there is an onset where again, there is a, a huge burst of non-selling of these sort of avatar pictures, which then, however, in the wake, um, has a lot of things that actually do sell sort of like, um, you know, as, um, I don't know, uh, accidentally or whatever. So there's a really interesting thing that we can now discuss sort of like the quality of artworks aesthetically in uh, multiple different ways against these sort of art market dynamics and um, dynamics over time. Obviously, and this is just the first glimpse. Um, <clears throat> here, just to completion, um, you can see uh, at the top three rows are the artworks that were um, the top 25 artworks um, at the beginning of the NFT market. And at the bottom, you can see uh, the ones at the uh, end of this of our study period. And you can see there is very clear difference in terms of like, uh, you know, how complex these artworks are. Another thing we can do with our thing is uh, we can actually say, okay, now we have embedded these artworks in a multidimensional space. And we wanna know um, how does this space evolve over time? 
And uh, as a first uh, sort of like sizzle for that, because obviously there is plenty of work to do, let's just look at uh, individual artists and how they move through that space. And uh, we came up with a concept called temporal resemblance, which works the following way. It's not the general zeitgeist, but it's basically the top uh, nearest uh, neighbors, top 100 nearest neighbors uh, to an artist which uh, of a painting, which are not by the same artist. Okay, so, so the idea is look at an artwork uh, and you look at the nearest neighbors, um, the hundreds and your hundred nearest neighbors, except for the artworks that are by the artists themselves. And just by doing that, we uh, obviously we can draw a plot which um, sort of moves left to right over the career of the artist. And then top to bottom, we can say, um, relative to these hundred neighbors, they all have a date. So there is a median date. Um, is the artwork of the artist from which we measure ahead of its time, in time, or sort of like lagging behind. And just by doing that, we get a really clear notion of different career types. It's almost like the narrative types of Kurt Vonnegut. Um, and so you can see uh, Piet Mondrian, and I have a better picture later, um, starts out sort of mainstream and then sort of like very clearly sort of <coughs> rises above the median. And uh, yes. Uh, the um, Paul Sun, the second category is people who are slightly ahead of time all the time, but are also very versatile. So Cezanne can actually draw uh, and do paintings that look like Titian or Rubens. So really old school paintings. He does this, you know, if he does a portrait for a friend and stuff like that. Uh, while people like Albert Bierstadt, who's famous for his American landscapes, uh, you know, basically all the posters of national parks, uh, sort of even if they're photographs, are basically versions of a Bierstadt painting, one could say. Um, so he's very much in line with his uh, 100 nearest neighbors. So he's very zeitgeist in sort of what people expect, but sort of like obviously specific in what he depicts. So that's the reason he's famous. And then there's these people like Whistler uh, or Mary Chase, who sort of rise to their moment in time and then either sort of like become boring again or the world catches up with them. That's obviously also a possibility. Um, <laughs> so, right, um, no matter how original you are, if people are sort of like just following and doing your stuff, then basically you will still be sort of like look old. Um, okay, so here's the same thing, sort of like looking in large. Um, Mondrian, you can see the beginning very realistic. If you have ever been to the place where he painted in Domburg in the Netherlands, uh, different parts of the day staring into the land or out at sea, you can actually see these kind of colors. Um, but then he realized, okay, red bricks, a blue sky, uh, becoming more stereometric and over time. And, you know, it's like at some point his trees become ever more regularized. And then that's when he literally takes off. And so this is like how this plot is explainable. Um, similar, you can, what I just said about Sisan, you can see that in the plot too, um, and the same for Bierstadt and, and Whistler. So this is sort of like um, um, what we can do with this, but then um, I just want to return to this little picture here. So this is really constituting a new field of study because now we have constituted that space. And uh, what we can do is we can, for example, embed all the images that went through a neural network or have been studied by an art historian. Um, and we can actually compare, um, you know, how do they behave? How do different embeddings behave and stuff like that? So this is really sort of a reference. Um, um, you know, we have a reference topography, which is our UMAP, but this plot um, in addition sort of like is a kind of topographic array against which we can compare many, many other things. And if you don't like the fact that it looks irregular and whatever, that's, um, you know, obviously uh, one could do a different way, but the key thing is that it works. That's, that's sort of the cool thing. Um, one thing that led to this picture, which I would like to show you is that you can basically take any two dimensions um, and what I will show you will uh, uses TCNE, not UMAP, but it could be anything. It could be PC1 and PC2. Actually, I think it's PC1 and PC2 of uh, some other principal component analysis thing with a preliminary data set. Um, so imagine the value range of PC1 is the x-axis, the value range of PC2 is the y-axis, and then you just cycle through PC3, for example, right? And so to do that, I need to sort of like uh, reshare my screen um and so here you can see this happening right and 
I, I, I encourage you to stare at particular points. So uh, let me go here. Like you see my mouse here. So you see something that sort of like is, is sort of an attractor that, uh, you know, sort of like is a sink, uh, while um, there is other uh, points in the space that sort of like, um, you know, spread um, uh, information. And so showing this to people in the lab, um, there is, you know, plenty of things that come to mind, uh, obviously, you know, burning gas and attractors and uh, stuff like that. Um, so the, the key thing is, I think this is something that warrants further studies in all its dimensionality, um, because um, there is a lot of information in here that we uh, don't fully understand. It is not just arbitrary sort of like errors of um, you know projection in the UMAP, for example, but there is something else going on. And so the question is, can we actually from here go to a kind of, uh, you know, not only artificial neural science, but a kind of multidimensional fluid dynamics of meaning. Uh, when I when I proposed this the first time to the ERC, I was declared nuts, and I'm 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 very happy that we're getting closer to it. Uh, so at least we, we won't be declared nuts next time. I hope. Um, okay, so let me reshare my screen again, um, and then go on. So I I've used about forty minutes of my time. Um, and now I, I'm going to give you a cavalcade through other spaces. Um, so far, we have talked about visual family resemblance. We have constituted this uh, multidimensional space across these arbitrary transformations. And there can be no doubt this is probably different for every one of us. Um, but the key thing is, like, no matter what sunglasses you wear, you should wear different sunglasses and basically squint like an owl from different sides. Uh, it's something to understand it. So um, our one sentence. Um, summary of what I just showed you is like um, uh, you need uh, sort of like a variety of shitty perceptions lead to deep understanding. That's basically sort of the one sentence. Okay, so um, relational space. So there is something completely different going on, which still is not the Euclidean three-dimensional space. So multiplicity of complex networks. So this is one sort of medium simple database entry of a decorated column base, like, you know, the thing that is like at the bottom of a, of a Corinthian column, um, um, publications about it, uh, locations it is or has been, uh, events when it has been restored, uh, who has documented it and stuff like that. So this is sort of like a hypergraph motive, which uh, sort of like is put into the database typically in one go. Uh, so all the information or maybe in multiple goes, but you can imagine, um, that um, a database in art research that sort of like collects all the information for uh, such objects actually sort of works like, uh, uh, you know, it's like a knowledge graph that is um, um, a superimposition of such motifs. This reminds of the graph rewriting, um, I think, um, that we uh, talked about yesterday. Uh, obviously, it's not that simple because it's different every single time. And just to give you a notion of like how not simple this is, is the uh, size distribution of these hypergraph motifs that are put into such knowledge graphs typically is, um, Sort of fat tail distributed. So there's very uh, there's a lot of things that are you know where you have one nugget of information, but sometimes you have like a massive thing that like comes together and makes only makes sense if it comes together. So now, but one thing that is important here, this is the state of late nineties, is that we got a network with different node types and different link types. This took a very long time for network science to catch up on, which is now called multi-layer, multiplex, and multi-whatever um, uh, network science. Um, and we still have not made fully sense of how this sort of like works um, in terms of generating mechanisms, in terms of dynamics, in terms of possibility and stuff like that. But what we know is we have a complex system of um, like a network of complex networks, basically. Here you see one smallish art historical database. Um, the matrix is the data model and the cells are the different link types um, that are sort of like here all depicted. So you see all the instances of such a, a database in one data model. And um, I don't wanna go into full detail. So please leave the book chapter if you wanna know how you can extract such an image from uh, a, a knowledge graph database or any other relational database for that manner. I just want to point to the fact that this is sort of the master construct 
uh, over smaller uh, sort of selections of networks. So what you see in the upper left corner here, monument documentation, this is what my PhD was on. This is what the so-called census of antique works of art and architecture known in the Renaissance was on. This is what Warburg's Nemusuna Atlas was basically on, right? So he looked at images that correlate via some similar depiction type. And so this is exactly this kind of network. Um, in the lower uh, center here, you see person location. Um, and this in particular is the, was the smoking gun for uh, something where I then said, how does this look, look for 100,000 people, people moving from their birth to their death location? Um, so monument documentation, this is a picture of my PhD and I'm, I apologize for the resolution. This is a monument documentation network for 35,000 links uh, drawn in a, a Java uplet, which uh, warned that you shouldn't do anything larger than 500 nodes because other than that your computer will crash, it took three days. Um, <laughs> but the key now looks much better and takes 20 seconds, of course. Um, so the key thing is this is just one network, something you find in this one cell here. Uh, and the second thing would be, um, would be sort of the cell down here. I get to that back later. Now, one of the interesting things is this is not new. This is now new in network science that we do multiplex networks since you know, 2008-ish. Um, but it is actually quite old. Ebi Warburg actually starts his Memnusuna Atlas, where all the plates are about similarity, with plate one, where he says the following. Different systems of relations in which humans are put into, cosmic, earthly, and genealogic. And so basically the pictures he depicts is star signs, so you know, conceptual links between arbitrary nodes. Um, earthly, what he means is distance between locations, so obviously the you know, um, uh, wayfinding, route planning, um, and kinship, which is the genealogy. So he also says actually separating all of these is already something that requires thinking. So in mythical thinking, that's his hypothesis, all these things are one thing. Um, now, one of the neat things is these three plates are basically three cells in the matrix I've just shown you. And obviously we can look at all these other cells too. And uh, if you do this systematically, uh, you can do things like this. So here I um, told you monument documentation, person, birth or death location, which actually led us to Net Science uh, Magazine where we looked at so how people move from, noted people move from birth to death location, which recovers the so-called laws of migration of Robinstein. Uh, and at the same time recovers the instability of cities over centuries, which is a fundamental instability. Um, it looks similar in different data sets, uh, but nevertheless is, 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 is massive. Um, and so um, it's a really interesting result because um, what this means is that A, quantification humanity is possible and B, uh, qualitative research is necessary because on a local level, there is so much fluctuation that you basically have to check in the archive. Okay. So this is like this paper, um, and there was a famous video that came with it. Um, here's sort of like some of the plots. Um, and so you can clearly see, and this is sort of something which is also quite interesting from the history of science. Um, uh, obviously the plot um, um, uh, conventions are either coming from complexity science, you know, these uh, sort of like cumulative tail plots, or from demographics, which is like what you can see uh, the, the blue thing, um, is the sort of like death age over time. And at the bottom, um, this is sort of um, death rate over expression or under expression, uh, which is um, something that, you know, yes, it's a timeline plot, but uh, the paradigm was stolen obviously from a gene transcription plot. So this is kind of a, a multidisciplinary side note that, uh, you know, never, never, never stop reading stuff that other people do in other disciplines, maybe worthwhile. Okay. So now we have two kinds of spaces covered. So we have a, a, a multidimensional vector space and that is measured. And we have a, a topological space of networks where there is not necessarily a, sort of like an extension on a, sort of the space, but it's literally just topological space. Now, the question is, 
grid space, where does this come from? How does this emerge, right? Like this thing that we have like sort of geographic latitude, longitude coordinates or X, Y, C in computer games and stuff like that. Because now this is so fundamental that people think it's, the, it's you know, it, it must be first, right? So <clears throat> that's what I, why I call it AKA space. And so where does this come from? And so I added this to this talk um, just to give you a perspective from the point of view of art history and the history of drawings. So this thing, is the figure one from uh, Euler's 1736 Königsberg Bridge problem paper, which, uh, by the way, in um, sentence one, he says he stole the idea from Leibniz. Um, um, Geometrium situs really means analysis situs. And one of the interesting things here is that, um, so this is a map of Königsberg, which is obviously very reduced and symbolic. <coughs> I'm sorry for, for coughing now. Uh, found out two days ago that I'm corona positive. <laughs> so the key thing is here, um, the, the map is reduced and basically reduced to symbolic letters. So A, B, C, D writ large is the locations and uh, A, B, C, D, G, uh, E, uh, F is actually the bridges. So nodes and links, so to say, right? And this is sort of like seen as the start of graph theory and network science. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that uh, it seems like that uh, Euler made the step of adding these symbolic uh, letters, uh, that there is a great amount of originality in there. But um, I'd like to make you consider the material that he was exposed to. This is a map by Merian, which is uh, older. Uh, something like this map Euler probably saw. Um, and uh, I would like to point you to the legend at the bottom, which actually has reference letters, A, B, C, D, F, G to M, uh, which actually symbolize, um, you know, uh, sites uh, or, or points of interest in the city, like the castle is A on top, the church is F on the island, and so on, right? So this is a sort of notion that was sort of ubiquitous in maps like this. Now, one of the interesting things is that this Marian map is a perspective that is quite like, you, just think about that. There, there were no airplanes, there were no balloons and stuff like that. Somebody has to come up with this. They have to measure, triangulate, and then basically like build a little model, at least on paper or on their head, uh, to actually be able to sort of like draw that in, in perspective. Um, let me give you an earlier example. This is a drawing by Giovanni Antonio Dozio. Um, of the city of Rome that very much sort of like represents that. And I, 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 I colored the Roman baths in here, which are either sort of fully or um, not fully, but you know, better or not so well preserved in blue or red. Um, and so this map is fantastic. So it looks like a tiny drawing, right? But <laughs> the key thing is like, there is no spec on this map that doesn't have meaning and wasn't really there. If you, you can see that on different other Map. So this is obviously what the, what's underlying the Marian depiction. There is no reference letters on this map. Now, if you go to older examples, like much older examples, you find things like this. Uh, this is Rome built in the mode of a line, around 1330 or something like 14th century. And now uh, this looks like a really shabby depiction of Rome, but there is a number of landmarks. And if you know your way, if you know the streets, like, you know, you walk down uh, Alta Semita uh, from the Bath of Diocletian, that awfully looks like the tail of a lion. And then you do this turn and then you see the city in front of you. So this thing is perfect for wayfinding. Even today, if you know how to read these things, which is not quite easy because names change and stuff, uh, you can use this map to find your way around in Rome today. And certainly on that map that those you just painted. And so the interesting thing is this is much closer to what Euler does than uh, what um, um, what Dozio does, right? Um, so you have these sort of reference points, and you know there is no real uh, cool angular relationship and stuff like that going on. But sort of relationship-wise, this per makes perfect sense. Now uh, let me let me let me drive home that point a little further. How are these Marian-like depictions, like the good perspectives, how are they done? Typically, you go into the field and you document parts and fragments, samples of the ruins uh, and, and, and parts of the city. And then you work your way up 
to have sort of like a, a sort of more complete reconstruction, which you see in the center here. Then ironically, these complete reconstructions are sampled again and remixed, which is a whole other talk, whole other story. And actually this whole sort of like nexus of grid space here, I could talk for uh, easily an entire semester, but I don't. I just wanna give you one example. So um, what you see in the first row, second picture from the left, this is a convolute of about 200 drawings uh, of the boss of Caracalla, which assumes symmetry, by the way, um, which uh, sort of try to reconstruct or allow for a full reconstruction of the boss of Caracalla. And I'm gonna show you one drawing from that. So this is 1455. Um, okay. Um, Okay, this is the one. This is 1455. You see the full drawing on the right and you see a cutout uh, on the left. And so you can see that actually this is not one drawing. Um, here this triangular staircase reappears here on the right with a reference letter called B, which actually roots it in the, uh, in the, in the original drawing. You can see these geometrically congruent uh, things like, you know, these kind of um, rectangular pillars with a column in front with additional measures. So the key thing is what you have here is a drawing that is actually a not geometrically congruent, but sort of like blown out of proportion in different ways. And whenever the space is not sufficient enough, you do a call out. You, if, if, if you think it's too hard, you do a reference letter and then basically you sort of like uh, make your way in. And it's really hard one to arrive at a situation like this where you actually have full geometric congruence with the ruin. So this is uh, so-called Master C of 1519 in the Albertina in Vienna, who um, was a very incredible architect, but we don't know who it was. And here you don't need these measurements. You don't need the callouts because you can actually measure on the drawing. So in other, way, in other words, it's really hard one to arrive at grid space where you can actually do that. And typically this happens via these kind of relational uh, sort of references. And I like you to consider that whenever you look at a 3D reconstruction that uses ground plan, elevation, section, and perspective, including in modern computer games in Unity or Maya or whatever Pixar does, there is typically a graph in the background of relational uh, program functions that call themselves uh, and actually pull together the assets to actually sort of embed stuff in this space. So it's not that grid space is the base of everything, but cognitively the relation are sort of like what basically binds it all together. And then we project it into this sort of like ideal space. Okay. Um, so I have two more points. Um, Conventional space. Um, so also throughout the conference, we had this uh, thing that, um, you know, the question is how real is the space that you depict? <coughs> and so there the question is, okay, is there such a thing as a kind of relationship between what you think and what you depict, or is there something else going on? And so this point here, this, this title here is a little snarky. Uh, I call it AKA Horizon 2020 because we published it in 2020 in PNAS and the paper is about horizons. So it's dissecting landscape art history with information theory. And so here we did something very, very simple. Uh, we took 15K landscape paintings and for whatever reason, my slide forwarding seems to jump. Um, okay, now this works. So what we did is we basically dissected artworks to minimize or maximize the entropy difference between the two sides of the dissection. So ideally, if you do this until the end, uh, you should end up with rectangles that basically have the same, same color of pixel. And now, uh, very long story, very short, uh, this really works well for landscape painting and it particularly works well for the first dissection, basically the horizon. And so you can see this in figure E, uh, so the uh, horizontal and vertical, the first, uh, dissection are really sort of meaningful and differentiate the whole thing. I don't want to go into detail here. Um, this actually, I, interestingly, evolves over time. So the dominant horizon in the majority of paintings evolves contiguously over time. 
if there is national differences, it's because the nations are, have a sampling bias. So Dutch landscape painting we typically have from the 17th century, a lot of landscape paintings we have from different centuries. So that may be a national difference. There is no national difference. It's actually, we learned that from a reviewer. Thank you to that person. Uh, but you can see here in the upper uh, left, um, in the second plot from the left, you can actually see these two pink lines, uh, magenta lines. You can see that this, uh, there, there is some systematic thing going on. And actually, uh, this is much more nice in this particular plot. Uh, here you see three versions. So over years, so 20 year brackets, um, moving time window, conventional style periods. So the style periods we got from the data set and just artist individuals. And note that the uh, dissection ratio, which is on the x-axis, is very broadly distributed. So all sorts of stuff is possible at all times, but you can clearly see that the peak uh, of the, 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 the first, you know, the, of the, the peak of the one modal distribution, and it's always a one modal distribution is also interesting, uh, actually moves from sort of like 0.5 to 0.3 over time. So you can um, probably most clearly see this um, in the individuals, even though it's more noisy, but you can see systematic left. Um, I also would like you to, this is probably something for the uh, Carlos sort of mentioned after number, you know, there's number, space, time, and whatever. So I, I, I sort of anticipate the next conference will be temporal temporality. Um, in this plot, you can see three different timelines of art history, uh, which are nonlinear in different ways. So to the left, you see sort of like linear um, 20 year brackets, but then to the right with the, uh, the number of artists grows exponentially and the number of, um, as such, the buckets of style periods sort of like bifurcates quicker over time. So you can actually see the same phenomenon in different timelines actually. Okay, so now we got a number of different things together. We got similarity space, we had multidimensional vector spaces, um, of the different transformations. We had uh, relational space of networks with different node and link types. And we talked about grid space. And I talked a little bit about this conventionality. And I actually should uh, mention this to you here. So there is absolutely zero expectation why this should be the case. There's zero expectation why the dominant horizon should move systematically over time. So there's two reasons why this could be. One is there is a systematic storytelling error on, on behalf of the people who do landscape art history um, or the selection, uh, or uh, it's actually true. Probably it's a mixture of both, right? Because there's this kind of thing that, um, you know, more interesting stuff happens on the ground. And like, as we have more photography, people sort of like, you know, there's more, more sky. Um, so this may be the case, we don't know. But the key thing is in this paper, and this is too difficult to, 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 to like fold out here, but I encourage you to read it. It's really important to look at these art data sets, not as art history, but what they actually are, are sort of the um, waste product um, of sort of large reprographed uh, sets of images typically for you know, lecture series and stuff like that from a literature which itself selected from the historical material, which may be reflecting history. So there's like several filters going on. It's really difficult to take, uh, take a, a hold of real art history. And so one way to do so is to actually look at full catalog resumes of artists, which is sort of what we do in the compression paper. Um, that I introduced at the beginning. But so there's this kind of thing that it's really hard when you do quantitative art history. It's like, when are you talking about the discipline of art history? And when do you talk about art history, the historical system? So, but the key thing is landscape art history is very, very clearly, landscape painting is very clearly conventional because it seems to be so bounded. This is sort of also qualitatively known. Landscapes are brown in the foreground, blue in the background until about 1830. When Constable then finally sort of like does some green in the foreground. Um, similar things happen like and basically the inverse, which I think is quite interesting, is there is no such thing as different style periods we now call isms. In this paper, we find that the construction of the horizon in the landscape is basically the same across all isms. So we're not living in the period of 
um, isms as style periods, but we're living in the style period of isms. It's one style period, which is quite funny. So variation of a many, many different parameters, but sort of like some parameters stay fixed, which is in this particular case, the horizon. Okay, so now that we have all these different space concepts, similarity, which is one kind of relation, but a special one, relations in general, um, um, grid space in general, and the question if this is conventional. Now let's talk about space in general. And so this, please give me another uh, sort of like eight to 10 minutes. Um, this particular slide is actually uh, a reference to an apocryphic joke or the joke that's an apocryphic story about Abby Warburg. So Abby Warburg, as I said, lost his distance by looking at too many uh, similar images and basically he ran into the problem that his matrix of similarities um, is obviously, um, you know, you can permutate it forever. <laughs> and, and sort of like he, he was known to sit in a corner and sort of resorting his photo papers. And at some point he went nuts over it. And uh, so when he was sort of like in the sanatorium, which were famous, um, uh, supposedly a nurse came up to him and said like, Mr. Warburg, uh, your family is in the space, room and space, same word in German. And he supposedly has said, do you mean, space per se in general, or this space in particular. And so what I do in the next eight minutes, hopefully gives you a glimpse of like what is meant by this, because this seems like a joke, but it's not. Okay, so here is Leibniz's core definition of space. And I think that is sort of something that is really, really important. So this is after a very, very long time, Leibniz ends up with this document in 1714, which is called Initiarum Mathematicorum Metaphysica. So basically the, um, the, the outline of uh, mathematical metaphysics things, um, which he also called De Calculus Citum. So about the calculus of Citus, so analysis of Citus. And so I, I, I like to point you to, to this one definition. Spatium, space, is the order of coexistence, or the order of existence between those who are seen. Cetus is the mode of coexistence, therefore not involving quantity, but quality. So here's the point. The space is constituted by at least, obviously, two CT, or maybe one, um, that are seen, meaning they're at the same time, compresent, as he says somewhere else. And he very explicitly says, there's no quantity going on here. It's just quality. So this gives you the relational space already. So this is from, from there, it follows you can do relational space. But then he says, okay, extensio is the spatial magnitude, the ratio is the temporal magnitude. And obviously that's when he means, okay, we can make this quantitative by having extension uh, across space and duration. And uh, so I could, talk long about this, a very long story, very short. Uh, this is if you follow um, the sort of like bifurcations <laughs> um, or trace back the sort of like ancestor's tale, uh, you will find out that this is what Euler goes back to with his uh, Königsberg bridging, which from which follows cross your network science. This is also where Poincaré's analysis situs comes from, who ironically had to edit the manuscripts of Leibniz. He read all of them and then had his own analysis situs and never published the Leibniz pieces. Um, but he adds himself as like sort of Leibnizian by sort of listing the terms in 1910. So obviously topology flows from that. The interesting thing is that uh, Couturat's algebra of logic also goes back to this, which we know from Chardin, who's, who actually ties it in a foreword to Leibniz. And that is the basis for Shannon's master thesis of circuit diagrams. Um, and then for me, obviously one of the most important connections is Ernst Cassirer brings all of this together with his substance and function philosophy of science and as a philosophy of symbolic forms, which is the root of the kind of art history we're sort of circling around of, um, you know, Eben um, Warburg and so on. So all these things can now be brought together because as you have seen, I use network science, I uh, you know, use computation, whatever. But the key thing is this does not need to be separate. It's not like as an art historian, you call in the cavalry to do your computation and stuff like that. It really has to be thought as one process. That's sort of like one of the key take homes here. And um, how does this fold out? Let me give you some glimpse into Kassir's uh, sort of view of the world. In 1925, in a fulminant three pages, 
um, he writes down in his three volume massive um, philosophy of symbolic forms, a three page summary of his spatial concepts, which come from Leibniz over uh, substance and function, a bunch of other things, uh, which he calls a foundational outline of a doctrine regarding the symbolic form of myth. And uh, so in this sort of doctrine, there is four different types of spaces. One is mythical space. This is the same idea of our book has that sort of like, before you all separate these concepts, there must be one thing. So this is what they're actually after. This is basically the question, they, they were really poignant. They said like, how does the worldview post Chardana Bruno, uh, right, the mathematical worldview arise from this, like whatever was there before. And so obviously this is the one thing where they may be the most off because now we make progress. Uh, but then there is these other three concepts of space, which are really, really cool. Three is metric space, which Euclidean geometry underlies its construction. This is what we just talked about when we talked about architectural drawings. And then four, the space of pure knowledge, space of geometric intuition, thought, space of pure mathematics, thinking space of geometry, pure space of geometry, geometric conceptual space, abstract space of pure knowledge. He does a Lauritan litany, like the names of St. Mary on this space, because he actually is very aware that he cannot put it into words. But it's very clear when he means pure mathematics, if you read substance function, what he means is, is indeed Hilbert, right? So he means pure mathematics. So that means there is, um, it can be multidimensional and so on. There's like all sorts of stuff that follows from that. And basically, I think what this captures is both the relational space and these multidimensional vector spaces. And then one thing that glues it all together is this second concept, which is to central space of perception, seeing and tactical space, facial space and tactical space, which is very clear, he says, is anisotropic. So basically the idea is if you assume the real world is really three-dimensional Euclidean, and inside your brain, you have some kind of pure geometric mathematic knowledge space going on, either relational or whatever, then there needs to be some kind of transformation, what Warburg and Edgar Wind called, um, they called this Hingabe and Behauptung. So there's stuff coming out of the brain, stuff going into the brain, there's some kind of transformation function, a little bit like the transformation, like Lawrence transformation between reference frame and general relativity. And this is this is not too far out because Kassira actually wrote the uh, sort of an explanation, a whole book on uh, general relativity, which is actually proofread by Einstein. So th th these kind of things are uh, are not too far out uh, uh, to, to, to actually have substance. It's, it's a really interesting thing that they basically laid out in front uh, in order to sort of like make it actionable, but then art history never followed up on it because obviously art history is done by humanists and there's this kind of like way of working that we work now is just not there. Okay, so one uh, slide here just to uh, give you an idea that this is really Leibnizian. Max, this is the same. Yes. Max, uh, uh, Tal is asking what, what is the name of the book that Einstein uh, has read? Um, yeah, um, give me give me a second. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I will look it up in a second. OK, so sorry, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm too much in the talk. OK, so uh, here's just one one notion that um, like this is really Leibniz. So Kassir means with the litany becomes crystal clear when he says elements or points that connect to constitute geometric space are nothing else but positional situations, Lagebestimmungen, have no content outside these relations, purely functional, no substantial being. And he talks about generating mechanisms and stuff like that. It's really fascinating. So this is actually also word by word, almost the same as sort of like uh, Poincaré's um, explanation of analysis cetus in 1910. Um, okay, so obviously there is, a bracket we can put around um, all these different things. So this concept, and obviously I only gave you a glimpse here of space, symbol, symbolic relations, symbolic form as defined by Kassira as inspired by Leibniz is obviously uh, very much related to these other concepts like Leibniz methodology, quantum mechanics and physics, vector spaces and machine learning feature spaces, which means you, know, you just measure brightness or like in our case, uh, we measure these different transformation dimensions, not sort of like some, um, um, some, some neural network weights or whatever. So they're also vector spaces, uh, but they could also be categorical. I could say, you know, male, female is, is, is a category dimension. Um, the curse of dimensionality, like how do you actually project and stuff like that in data visualization, bipartite classification in libraries, 
and so-called kinds of relations slash multilayer networks. And this is really fascinating. Leibniz actually spells this out. He says like um, similarity, order, and relations universally. So he basically sort of like gives you the exact the structure of this talk. There is similarity, then there is sort of like more general networks, and then there's like all sorts of dimensions uh, in general. Okay, so basically that's it. Um, um, I hope I gave you some sort of like different aspects again. Um, and so I hope uh, they all sort of like fit together somewhat. Um, but I follow the same strategy as with our uh, sunglasses in front of a neural network or the compression um, 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 approach, where basically we look at uh, the system in different ways, and that will lead to deeper understanding. And um, I like to um, give kudos to um, all my collaborators. Uh, and so this means in particular for the landscape paper, this is a Korean team uh, around byung Lee Lee, who is the first author, Hao Wong Yong from KAIST. Um, obviously people at Barabasi Lab at ETH Zurich, which, uh, whom I have done this like um, birth death paper. Um, Many people I have been involved in uh, all my life. Uh, lo lots of this work goes back 20 years. And then the last thing is actually Andres Karius, Tilmanom, and Mark Conet from our own team, and Sebastian Arnold from um, the University of Cambridge and the Turing Institute. And uh, so obviously this is only one aspect of the kind of stuff we have going on. Um, here you see the six senior and uh, junior fellow and the six junior fellows of the Cultural Data Analytics uh, era chair research group, which is a thing that is a 2.5 million euro project funded at Tallinn University by the European Commission. And one of our goals is to A, sustain what we're doing. And um, we aim to do so by uh, sort of exploring at the one hand, these kind of systematic spaces, but all of the fellows actually have more specific topics, which basically allow them to sort of like sustain themselves without um, being endangered by the um, by the problem that true multidisciplinarity, as it is supported by SEMF, is not something that is really easy to support um, if you're sort of dependent on regular funding institutions. So you need some kind of home, um, and then you could do crazy stuff in essence. So, um, and I made the mistake to do crazy stuff exclusively. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Max. I should say the very uh, fortunate mistake to do crazy stuff. <laughs> Um, yes, thank you so much. Uh, this, this was a very thought provoking and a, a nice overview of, of this application and indeed multidisciplinary as we were expecting as I sort of advertised and so you delivered on my promise. So I'm thankful for, for, for that. Um, so uh, Molly has a question already. I mean, we have time for questions, obviously. Uh, maybe I should use this time now to make yes. an announcement because we just got an email from Tony for, for the next session. And fortunately, apparently he was traveling today and his car broke down. <laughs> so he cannot make it home in time for, for his session. Um, I mean, he foresees that he's not gonna be home for hours and he should be home in like about an hour if he's gonna make it. So, um, so this means that we won't have Tony today and we will end uh, the week of sessions after this session but um I, we will follow up with an email because um mm -hmm. we wanted to so next week we officially had the workshop uh, scheduled and so this is always a flexible event it's very much lesser scale and it's much more informal um so we are going to follow up with some concrete uh schedule of tony's talk he's offered to to have his talk next week sometime um and so we'll we'll follow up to you know, uh, to, to to tell you that his talk is, is happening, but unfortunately it can't happen today. Um, so we will close the we will close the conference with a very appropriate talk with Max today, uh, and then uh, do 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 um, look out for our email because we'll we'll follow up and we'll we'll give you some details for next week. Okay, um, maybe <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Should I answer the question that like was uh, during the talk? So the book by ah, right. is. The book by Kassir is called Zur Einsteinschen Relativitätstheorie, which means uh, on uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. The English translation is called Substance and Function and uh, uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, which is sort of the 1910 substance and function fused with that sort of like Einstein's uh, relativity book. One has to say, if you read German by any measure, please read it in German, because 
Kassira did not, uh, he, he didn't have very much time at the time and sort of like he sort of, um, you know, he sort of approved it without, you know, there, there's differences, let's put it like that. I think that's, uh, and, and the differences are probably not, um, you know, I, I wouldn't, if this was a spaceship manual, I wouldn't fly with the English word. Okay, does that make sense? <laughs> Thank you so much for that answer. Right, Molly, please go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, thanks for a wonderful talk. Sorry, I can't turn on my video. I have uh, toddler craziness behind me. Um, but uh, uh, lots of wonderful information. Um, and thanks so much for reviewing the landscapes paper. I haven't gotten a chance since um, since Tuesday to take a look at it, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm curious if you've, um, so one of the cognitive, sali cognitive salient aspects of landscapes or scene depictions um, is whether or not they're open or closed. So um, the, basically the idea, uh, the difference between say a cityscape where there's buildings on all sides versus um, a natural or man-made scene where um, it's completely and totally open. So this is something that um, the, the sort of the, the geometry of the scene by this basic metric, right, open or closed, um, mm -hmm. that has to do with its navigability is really cognitively salient and um, uh, you know, folks doing cognitive neuroimaging and stuff have found that they're, the brain regions that are sensitive to scene information are really, um, are really sensitive to this particular feature. Did mm -hmm. you look at, so you said that the most distinguishing um, kind of demarcation was the horizon, right, the, the vertical. But mm -hmm. um, do you have any sense of how the, this vertical feature, or at least this kind of open versus closed element, um, may have changed over time? Or is there anything you can say about that feature just sort of um, uh, given mm -hmm. the analysis you've already done. So one thing that needs to be said is like this, this, this looks at 15K landscape paints. It's a very small sample uh, relative to what is really existing. Um, and it only, so basically it's coming from this notion of uh, aesthetic complexity, trying to uh, use sort of information theory to make any sense of painting. And as such, it is not as general as the question you, you, you just had, but based on my background with like regular uh, visual depictions uh, of what, what you have seen, there is, you know, people draw uh, buildings and ruins self-standing as an object um, by themselves, by itself. Uh, and then there is this sort of like reference plane and stuff like that going on, right? So, and so you can clearly see there's a number of types um, and uh, if you think in perspective, there's where it stands on itself on a white sheet of paper is a single object. Then there is when people do that multiple times, they often combine the things like, you know, what people do, for example, is really cool, uh, is they draw a ruin and they know there's another ruin behind it, but you wouldn't see it from, your, from the point where you're standing. So basically they walk up, draw that too, and draw it on a piece of paper so that you can actually see it like this. Other things people do is that Ma this master uh, C of 1519, for example, he did awesome perspectives of, um, of buildings, but then he violates the perspective. So you can actually see, like if there's a window like this, so you can actually see uh, sort of the wall on, on this side of the window if there's something interesting. So people violate these kind of things all the time. Like they do things like, you know, they, they contract lengths and just write a number down and, and stuff like that. So there's lots of weird relational stuff happening. Uh, and I think that is a really important uh, thing uh, to think about, that people sort of constitute the space in, in, in very weird ways. And um, from your own sort of like tradition in cognitive science, the one thing that I always find very interesting is there's a, there's a very rather uh, unknown guy called Ivo Kohler, who had these glasses that uh, put everything upside down. And so it takes about three hours for your eyes to sort of like adapt. And then he, you know, it's like introspection 1930s. He went skiing with his glasses and it seemed to work. So he could ski for the whole day. And then he took the glasses off. It took another three hours to sort of like readapt. But one of the interesting things he noticed is like, if you pick something up, uh, like a bottle or something like that, the bottle hangs down correctly while the rest of the world still is upside down. And so there, that obviously we're not a camera. So there's like something else going on, I think. And I'm, 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 I'm incapable of answering your question, but I think 
why are these kind of, there's a lot of really interesting uh, notions of perception that we can actually extract from uh, not only artworks, but graphical production people have made over centuries, which allows to deduct what, like, you know, how, these, how these kind of things work. And um, I, I do think that this is something where, um, how, how should I say, there is, you have seen the kind of work I'm doing with these kind of, like, I look at like 70,000 artworks at a time, right? This is very different from somebody doing a psychological experiment with 30 people in a very, very controlled fashion. Like my favorite example is in cultural evolution, people do things like, okay, an adult shows a kid how to build an Eiffel Tower out of plastiline and spaghetti. So, and then you can ask yourself the question, how well does that work? You can do a lot of inference about like what goes on in cognition by just doing that. What I'm doing is I look at artworks uh, in the same way as say the reconnaissance orbiter or Cassini looks at the atmosphere of Jupiter. And basically I'm saying, okay, I'm not looking at single atoms reacting with other atoms. I'm just zooming out and I wanna look at the picture as a whole, what's the pattern in the atmosphere. And I think the two, the two approaches actually do complement each other. In order to fully understand, you need to do what you're doing. It's super important. While at the same time, you will never see the Kevin Helmholtz instability uh, behind the island, uh, right? In the atmosphere or behind that uh, storm on Jupiter, which may be actually fundamental to actually understand what's happening on a local level. So we actually need to study these both, both of these things. And this is similar to what, um, we were talking about yesterday, a lot of these sort of general assumptions that arise from the local work are sort of questionable from the general big picture, just like the general big picture often is very questionable if you do your control stuff, right? So, so I think very long story, very short, we need to hang out more and actually sort of like do that hermeneutic feedback loop between general and special, I think. Wonderful, <laughs> thank you so much. Right. Any more questions? Any more comments? I have a few because uh, I was very enticed by the, um, the UMAP and, the, and and all this. So I'll, I'll go with, with my questions and then we have some more sure. time. So feel free to, to think about more questions. Um, so maybe you can share that th those pictures again. Can you can you uh, share the? <clears throat> yes, sure. Mm. Let me move to our first event share. Okay, move, move, move. I, I started my academic career as a slide shock at university, and it strikes me as funny that we have to do this now myself, ourselves. Okay, so. <laughs> yeah, this this is the picture. I mean, I I really enjoyed, um, so, so, okay, so one question I have is, and, it, and this is a question I always ask, in any machine learning and sort of classification, when, whenever mm -hmm. anyone goes beyond, this is just the algorithm, this is the output, and there is any degree of interpretation or concept that goes beyond that. My question is, what are the metrics here? Like how, how do you measure distance in, in the full space? How does it project down? How does it correlate with the two-dimensional Euclidean distance that I see on the final picture and all this kind of story? Yes. Okay. So UMAP is something you can imagine as a like like a simple. It's not the same thing, but as a simple um, bridge uh, in your head. Um, it's very related to spring embedded network layouts. Um, and if you've ever done a spring embedded network layout for a large network, like four satellites to and and chafing with different gravities, playing with parameters, stuff like that, you will figure out that a obviously no picture is is is, is unique. Um, there is, you know, for example, you could flip this over here and there is there is no difference in meaning because uh, these things are connected, these things are connected, they're both connected at the root, and if you do this, there shouldn't be a difference, but all of a sudden, here the thumbs are close by and here the little fingers are close by. Obviously, this, is, this does not go away, and that's why I said it's actually surprising that we can use it as a reference topography. All of these dimensionality reductions, TSNI2, um, you know, they all have this notion of um, sort of 
they're they're good in the neighborhood basically right so so locally they're sort of like if you do what we do here right you look at a very closed region then there's sort of function and obviously there needs to be a connection at that point it's like umap sort of like get rid of the link but you could imagine there is some links between the nodes and uh, no links between the others. There is also interesting things like you see this island at the bottom. Yeah. That probably is connected to uh, many other places in the UMAP because it's multidimensional. So there's a kind of, you know, typically things that are very versatile because they're similar to many other things um, end up in weird locations, either like far out or like sort of central fused into something and stuff like that. So it has the very same problems as any network picture. But uh, I just want to remind you of that. If you would, uh, for example, say, OK, uh, let's take some arbitrary coordinates to um, um, locate all the musicians in the world, which are the geographic coordinates where they sleep, like where they live, mm -hmm. and it just put them on a two-dimensional plane like this. This will also, there is no correlation to the music, right? Because there's bassists everywhere and uh, trombonists everywhere and pianists everywhere and stuff like that. So inversely, you could say, oh, okay, they're more similar. If the instruments are more similar, you come up with a picture. It's wrong in a different way. So this is a very important notion that we use this picture only as a, a first order approximation, something that makes some sense locally, but then obviously you need to look at something that is more uh, specific. And I do think like what we do here with the average is actually sort of like stretching it a little bit. Um, mm. One could go more detailed and then you would actually find uh, some really interesting um, sort of differences, right? So if, if you would like die there, the different dots and stuff like that. So, but uh, I think this the, the 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 fascinating thing is that we can actually operationalize it, mm -hmm. even though there's plenty of papers that will tell you, uh, you know, how TSNE shouldn't be used or how UMAP shouldn't be used. The key thing is basically okay, if all you have is sort of a shitty topography, use that because it's better than no topography. <laughs> but you should be aware of the issues. And yeah. here's an interesting thing: um, these maps here tell you where the problems are which is quite funny <laughs> right so okay so so very very um i guess simplistically for me to understand so there is so i can understand that there is each pixel has the primary color whatever like well, the most mm -hmm. dominant color and, and represents each uh an art piece so that that's this is a very nice depiction just the game of i have a 2d uh array of like spatial array so obviously there is if, if we depict something on a flat surface in a flat pixel value uh, um, array, there is the human eye implies a metric, implies a, an Euclidean metric. When you when you when I look at it, I see that the point in the on the left is further from the point on the right, and the, you know there's like clumps of lighter color that are closer together and clumps of darker mm -hmm. color that are closer together, mm -hmm. and things like that. So that that is. So my question is. Are you leveraging these sort of factors when choosing how to do this projection? Because I imagine, as you said, this is a very high dimensional projection into 2D. So yeah. are those factors so, leveraged or how do you choose this particular projection? <laughs> that, that, that's a really curious question. So, um, of course, like everybody else, we chose UMAP because it's sort of the, not the hippest, but maybe the second hippest method right now to do this kind of stuff. And uh, like gazillions of, um, of biology papers, uh, we have not much more justification than anybody else to use that particular method. As I said, it is, it is functionally gives you an impression. It is locally correct, but in general, you know, you, there is many different choices one could do. Probably it's hard to do them in whatever, you know, R, Python you do it in. Um, you know, there's, you get one output, but there is other versions where you can actually play with the parameters, but it gives you one sense making uh, sort of sort of output. But, and I think this is a really important thing. I think where the front lies in this kind of thing is the same thing we talked about principal component analysis, right? Principal component analysis is fundamentally looking at linear axes through the space, right? So you basically do this. It's not said that the space is actually linear. It's a really interesting thing. Like um, the, the, the question is where the front is on, on this kind of thing. That can we find out 
what the actual linearity of the space is. And there are more sophisticated methods. We have some ideas um, uh, are necessary. And uh, we think that this is actually something one could write a, a large funding proposal and, and sort of like spend some significant energy in it, not only in terms of cultural analysis, but um, adding physics um, and applied mathematics to actually make sense of what's going on beyond nearest neighbor similarity. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, in addition, then um, obviously, <laughs> once you get the mathematical solution and it's multi dimensional, you obviously want to perceptualize that too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not like, again, it's a very similar thing. It's not like you sit an art historian or a cultural historian or a, or a literature uh, specialist in the same room with a physicist and an applied mathematician and a graphic designer. That is, that just doesn't work. There is, there's, maybe uh, somebody who is <coughs> a visualization designer who also studied uh, enough applied mathematics to sort of like have an idea how to translate whatever some some specialist applied mathematicians come up with but this this is this is really hard work and i think it's uh, at the same the, the challenge is at the same level as uh, most of the hard things in systems biology hmm. but i'm fun, i'm very convinced about that and the difference is that we don't have anything to hold on, right? So there's, it's not like protein, which can be folded at 60 degree angles or, uh, you know, sort of like sequences of, of ACTG and stuff. So, yeah. Um, Shahida, please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks, Max. A very, very interesting presentation. I think a lot of it just passed over me. I don't know if I quite understood anything. Um, but uh, the question I have is, uh, uh, it's posed to both you and Molly. <clears throat> so in your response to her, you located the differences in your perspectives in uh, the specific versus the general. And I'm wondering whether um, the differences in perspective lies in um, the data set itself. So you were looking at the productions of specialists in the sense that they are artists, whereas um, the people in Molly's data set are lay people, they're not artists. So mm -hmm. um, that perhaps a distinction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. I, so w w most of what I presented works in a very uh, general way. So we, we can also look at non-art pictures. We can actually look at non-pictures. We get any kind of signal, basically. Um, that is somehow transformable and compressible um, or somehow networked. And so this is one of the wonders of network science that a, net, a true network scientist can work across all disciplines. And it's very similar to this uh, in, in this case of, of, of like working um, on quantitative aesthetics, even though the question is like, if it's x-ray pictures, it's still aesthetics, or should we call it something different? But so that is, I think, a very important point. And then uh, regarding that difference, um, I think it's very important, you know, there's, in my PhD, I tried to sort of like prove that Renaissance artists were not any less smart than modern classical archeologists. Uh, there's no correlation. And similarly with lay people, um, According to Fai Fai Li, a three-year-old child has seen about three billion images. And so the neural network is sort of exposed to like quite a, quite a number of things. And um, so the only difference may be that there is more explicit thinking about like what's going on, but that may also not be true. So, right, most artists paint big, and do paint, and that's how they learn about painting. There is no theory about it. And so that is something which I think um, we need to be a little cautious. So maybe there is at the same time more relation between these lay people and the artists and at the same time a huge difference because there may be different theories going on. I don't know. So it's a, uh, in other words, I don't think we can answer the question. It's a good question if we should, if we, uh, how this question should be answered. So a very interesting subject of study. Yeah, no, what it reminded me of is um, the work of Stanislas Dahani. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. him, mm -hmm. um, but he, he looked at the how mathematicians viewed mathematics texts compared mm -hmm. to people who were not mathematicians. And that's what sparked this thought for me, mm -hmm. is if we were to do a, neuro, uh, um, a, a study from a neuroscience perspective and um, observe what's going on in the brains of artists who are the specialists mm -hmm. and lay people, producing uh, diagrams, drawings, depictions of scenes, etc. 
Would we see the same areas of the brain light, light up would the, in the minds mm -hmm. of artists? Would it be more specialized, uh, like the taxi drivers, hippocampus is <coughs> mm -hmm. more specialized than, than mine or yours? Uh, yes. Well, just lots of thoughts running through my head, actually. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, so I don't know, Mara should answer probably too. Uh, say, but let me say this. So there's a um, like how the homunculus looks like in 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 uh, in, in, in different artists and lay people's cases. It's, I think is in general a really interesting question. Actually, in databases you find that too, right? So databases are sort of like the waste product of collective cognition, um, just like artworks are sort of like the waste product of of, of ex external cognition of artists or something you could say. Um, one of the interesting things, if you look at databases, you find things like I have one database which has a Romunculus, I say, because like Rome is like heavily overexpressed. And so, so you find that kind of thing going. Um, the other thing uh, is that um, there is a feedback loop between the general and the special, which we cannot underestimate. So obviously art history as an academic discipline um, takes off during the 19th century, like everything else. And um, one of the core audiences are the artists themselves. And once they realize there is art styles going on, every artist wants to found their own style and be like the genius of like founding an art style. So uh, that is sort of definitely sort of like a circular thing going on. Same thing with fraud, right? Like people who forge artworks. Uh, then you find a method like, oh, the roots are growing over the marble head. So obviously, what do people do next? Like they put the fake marble in the garden and like sell it 20 years later uh, with some fast growing roots and stuff like that. So this kind of feedbacks are something which we shouldn't underestimate. And there is definitely something going on here. So I, I would like to just point, and I think I mentioned him before in this discussion, to the artist Mario Klingemann, who um, is one of the machine learning artists working with latent spaces. And like one thing, um, that is going on right now is this eight by eight pixel artworks. So which <laughs> has the need sort of circumstance that you could enumerate all possible art, which is still a crazy large number, but eight by eight pixels sort of like is feasible, right? And so what he does right now is to say, okay, not only do I do artworks and then they are located in that space, but he has realized he as an artist is doing that. Why not do it systematically? So now what he's doing is actually sort of like, uh, measuring the space of what people have put in that space and then calculate what is the most far off point uh, in the space that is most distant from all the other people. So he sort of like, that's the very same thing as somebody who claims fracking gas fields in Texas <laughs> in the 1950s. Um, basically, he sort of like, um, you know, sort of like raises his chances to do something that's truly original. And that is something which is a feedback loop. He's at the same time an artist, but also the best art historian, because only when you do that, you can actually uh, do that kind of thing. And that probably leads to completely different homunculus, um, right? So it's not like how you draw, but um, right. So it's there, there, there's something higher order going on, which I think is, is quite at the same time intimidating <laughs> and um, also very, very interesting. So we. It, it, any notion that we could study the evolution of culture in a sort of naive way is uh, not taking into account feedback and complexity is probably doomed. That's sort of like my take home from that. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm actually going to follow up with that. But before, I think there's a question from YouTube um, mm -hmm. that um, Thomas B asks, Chinese landscape painting predates European efforts by millennia. Would you care to speculate how their work might impact your analysis? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so we, we actually in that landscape paper, there is some Chinese stuff, um, but obviously very low number. So uh, I wouldn't say millennia. So the thing we're talking about most, uh, we're talking about uh, preceding Euro European stuff by centuries, like Kaifeng, uh, which is these huge scrolls where, you, you know, you have sort of parallel perspective going on in very similar constructions as you would find, for example, the Odyssey frescoes, or the Nile mosaic in the West, where you have this kind of like perspective being sort of accumulated. Again, locally correct, but like in general, sort of like it is correct in the Chinese case because it's parallel perspective. And um, so one of the interesting things there is that 
uh, we shouldn't underestimate the connections, I think. So obviously anybody who has ever been at a place like the Taipei Palace Museum <laughs> will be humbled by the fact that anything that you think is like new in Europe is twice as old in China. Uh, but um, there is nevertheless a lot of overlap, right? The, the haircut of Buddha is the haircut of Alexander the Great, for starters. And so um, I'm, I, I wouldn't be surprised to find different roots. I mean, this is true, like in nature for everything. Um, it's also true in the West. There is different roots for, for similar effects. Like, you know, there's the altar of Ghent functions very, very different uh, from uh, contemporary depictions of um, similar style, uh, of similar um, number of people, number of objects in, say, Italy or something like that. So that is something which I think is a is a really important thing to take into account. One of the big problems of the whole discussion is that we do not have really good data sets for that are comprehensive. Like if you say Chinese landscape painting, we probably look at the same stuff again. Just like if we say Impressionist art, we look at the same stuff again, which means the 250 paintings that are in the Metropolitan and visible, and not the 2,500 uh, paintings of French Impressionist painting that are in the basement of the same museum, not even speaking of the 5,000 paintings that are sort of somewhere in Manhattan and nobody knows that they exist. So that is sort of something which I think is an important fact. Um, and in addition, um, we need to sort of like, I think, widen our um, sort of scope um, to include things which are not uh, counted the same way, right? So there is things that are considered high art in one culture, but not even looked at in another culture, uh, like little bowls in Korea, um, where one needs to sort of like level out what's the, um, you know, what we actually uh, take a look at. I think that is a super important thing, like fine art, uh is probably problematic just like uh if you say contemporary art like contemporary art in museums has a median age of 1965. um artworks art in general definitely is not what you can see in biennials and uh, art basel miami which is stuff you can transport in a in a in a in a, in a shipping container um and hang on a, on a wall in the living room that is not what art is so there is a more general concept so if we want to have the same generality uh looking at cultural production right now or 500 years ago either in china or in europe we need to have similar standards i think and these standards are currently not given whatsoever well, that's, uh, I think that's a very comprehensive answer. So perhaps we can uh, finish the, the, oh, Micah has a question. So, so Micah, please go ahead and I'll have one final comment and the slash question that I think could, could be a good ending note. Um, yeah, no, my question is just kind of related to what you, what you were just talking about. Um, I'm wondering if, if you've considered, um, you know, doing some analysis like with stuff from the internet, like memes or um, things that are moving more quickly. Um, mm -hmm. um, I, I really like the slide where you, where you show the, it almost looked like a time lapse where you slid through one of the parameters and it just made me kind of like uh, curious about like um, when you add like a temporal dimension and, mm -hmm. and I know in topological data analysis, like there's lots of really cool stuff happening um, mm -hmm. you know, for yes. like okay. predictive things yeah so i'm curious if there's okay. any direction there for you yes so uh okay so here's a um let me give you a twofold answer to this you just mentioned topological data analysis so one of the interesting things that happens right now is sort of surreal i think is that people do graph uh, neural networks meaning they take graphs and embed them into the neural network which basically puts them into a multi-dimensional vector space and then once you got the multi-dimensional vector space to do filtration and stuff like using topological data analysis you know persistent homology <laughs> to make a network out of it again and uh you know we all look at like where this will end is quite interesting but um so that is sort of like one answer to 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 that kind of question yes this is fundamentally interesting it's definitely something which we should do with this space um and um, to the beginning of your question um you know fast moving things yes that's exactly the issue why we analyze the nft data and why we analyze the historical data because we're interested in this sort of like um powers of 10 in terms of time um, and there is probably um, 
dynamics going on which are fluctuating system size level at any given time and there is probably um, you know second order kind of stuff happening over different time ranges stuff transitions that take centuries transitions that take a day and so i think that is a a, a super super interesting uh, thing to look at um and so let me let me add one point to this um why i think this is interesting um in um music uh there is a, a development that happened in the last hundred years which is this kind of exploration of sonic possibilities beyond node space and there there's this theorist called curtis rhodes uh, who has a one graph it's called the time domain where on the one end of the graph is the age of the universe and on the other end of the graph is sort of like single sample or the shortest time period possible and in between is what perceptible and like all that kind of stuff so so he, he sort of like uh, spans that out and like now imagine what we do as scientists if we put 500 years on a five centimeter plot right in this time domain plot we just move it in that in that kind of space sort of right and i think that is a super important notion that we can actually do these kind of movements and artists themselves has have also realized that and that's my last point so one thing that is fascinating about contemporary art things like mondrian is that if you take the fourier transform they all look similar it's pretty amazing so basically classic modern art is classic in a sense because the fourier transforms sort of leads to a power spectrum that sort of like looks like everything else one over f but there is some artists in the 1960s and 70s where the spectrum of the Fourier transform is all over the place because they've realized that you can actually play with the spectrum and so that is the exact same thing that goes on in music and so basically what you're uh, um, now um, after not only can we look at different time ranges? Not only can we use this to understand art, but we can use this to do better art. And that I think is a fundamental advance. Any kind of good art history will lead to new art. And that is sort of something which um, I cannot look forward enough to, right? Because let, let me give you a, a last point. I think what we've done is we have constructed a glorious bandpass filter and a bandpass filter can be used as an instrument and it can be played. Take two of those, one modulates the other. I think there's endless possibility of this. Thank you very much. Um, just, I, I have to mention because, you know, you're talking about a kind of like reflexivity and, mm -hmm. um, and I think something that's, that's exciting right now is there are some people who are using like tools from um, taking different prob probability theory tools from quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. it's different um, mathematical tools from quantum mechanics and applying them in various social sciences in in situations where like any sort of like uh, uh, all the, the 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 interactivity of measurement is like is 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 a complex system and and there's like a lot of feedback and potential for um, order effects and things like this and um, so I'll share some links um, in the discord but um, I think it's exciting that people are using some of the tools from quantum mechanics to be more, um, you know, mindful about how, how they set up experiments and analyze data mm -hmm. in, 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 um, in fields where there's like a lot of reflexivity. Yeah, that's my yes. comment. Happy to look at it. Yes, uh, very interesting. So perhaps as a, as a closing uh, thought slash question, uh, I think if, I found it very interesting when you showed this, um, Sort of individual time progressions, right? Where where you had different profiles of artists and how they they change their style, and you had this this quantitative way of of, of spotting these instances, right? So mm -hmm. so that 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 really sparked my imagination because uh, as you can imagine, and we've talked, you and me have talked a lot about this in in private. Um, there's a lot of discussion about innovation and about new research and um, all kinds of so how. Um, new directions of research should be um, decided and funded and all these kinds of these big topics, right? So I was wondering if um, you think that similar sort of analysis and uh, conclusions uh, perhaps can be derived for other, other fields such as academic production or scientific 
uh, writing or uh, mm -hmm. research uh, directions, proposals, things like that? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, there is this new field called the science of science, mm -hmm. um, which is a uh, there's an article called The Science of Science in Science Magazine, so I recommend that. Um, a friend of mine, Dashun Wang, who is sort of a um, leading figure in this area, um, has done some research regarding funding proposals. And it seems like that, um, you know, he, he, he looked at the ones who made it and the ones who barely made it, who, who did not make it, but barely did. And it turns out that those who barely don't make it, um, are typically more successful in the long run because there's these people are you know they have grit and do it anyway and stuff so um yes stuff like that can be done and is done uh, but obviously as as all these things this is like super dangerous um just like as with the artists it's good in hindsight uh, for science we know for example that uh grit like you know sticking with it is important um and obviously having your shit together is too um they call that high q <laughs> um and so you have your act together high q then you need to sort of like have production which is meaning grit um uh, but then there's the most important component which is randomness so so the fact that you will hit the one big thing in your career um is is not clear if that happens at 22 or at 65 even if you're 63 year old your probability that you will have high impact paper in 65 is basically the same as if you're 23. and so that is sort of something which i think is super important that uh, we should not judge for example people by that kind of thing because obviously you know somebody who does landscape painting like Bierstadt, it's really hard to sort of like stick out like mondrian People like Mondrian stick out for two reasons. A, there is nobody else like that in the data set. And B, um, there is, um, you know, he, they found this one trick pony. And um, there may be only so many one trick ponies. So that is sort of something which I think is, is fundamentally super important. So like any kind of evaluation, this needs to be seen with a grain of salt. And um, from, my, from my perspective, I'm very cautious about prediction. Uh, as you've seen, prediction we have done as um, uh, as an evaluation. And so Andres was the first author um, coming from computational linguistics. They need to do that kind of stuff. And so it's very good that we did that. But as a historian, as an art historian, um, you know, one of the neat things about art history is that, yes, there is biases like documentation bias, like observation bias, preservation bias, like, uh, you know, accessibility bias. There's all sorts of things. But, but then in the end, uh, you cannot fudge. Right. So there's no such thing as like somebody changing the layout of the city. So, you know, if you take a picture of the ruins of a city, that's what it is. That's what you get. And it's not all of a sudden that it will be totally different. I think that is a very important thing. Like looking at it in retrospect mm. has some uh, has some neatness regarding this. But I would be very cautious about predicting the future. On the other hand, it's very tempting. <laughs> yeah. No. So I, I think that more than predicting the future, I think there's a there is a push and a need in several forums that I've been part of in the last couple of years, at least, where mm -hmm. um, we there is a sense. There's a very intuitive sense by a lot of scientists and mathematicians that research is really safe, that most of the time research is really safe and is, con is sort of constrained by, I mean, this connects with the idea of multidisciplinarity and so on, of course, but um, the fact that you're producing mostly within a really safe boundary of, or, or, or um, neighborhood of, of set um, established uh, research, right? So do you <laughs> think, I mean, I'm just asking you to, to perhaps speculate a little bit or daydream that what, how would you go about doing similar analysis for, because mm -hmm. obviously this science of science, I'm aware with this paper that you, that you mentioned, and mm -hmm. I, I think that you mostly do sort of, sort of bibliometric analysis and, and sort of like uh, authorship network analysis and things like that. Um, but I'm wondering if you could imagine um, because the, what I like about the art case that you do is that you do have the 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 output as a as a as, as a sensory data for your for all your analysis right as, as data. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds it's it, it, I mean it feels very complicated to think of a of a say mathematical paper as as the sensory data 
for for any kind of analysis, right? Because I mean, how do you judge? The, I mean, you could just take all the symbols and all the language and just you know brute force it your way into it. But it feels that that would be way too you know uh, destructive mm -hmm. to the structure of the information. So I'm wondering if you can think of or daydream or speculate about you know if you were to take scientific production and the scientific endeavor as a whole mm -hmm. um, in the same vein that you're taking picture because I mean that's very well adapted I mean pixel pixel values in a you know in a grid whatever that it matches very well if you do high resolution enough with actual physical paintings or oil paintings or whatever and obviously digital art is already in that format so you don't even have to make that translation so can you speculate a little bit in that direction and what do you think could be done or yeah I <clears throat> I do agree that it's what's neat about uh, working with images is you can stare at lots of images in parallel mm -hmm. and as such you can draw a plot where the dots themselves are the images so you can actually look if this makes sense obviously there's limits to that uh, the umap plot is a good example right like they make sense locally but the general structure you have to be very careful you need to know that and so that is sort of like a thing which is really neat and a huge advantage over linguistics Yes, you can do word clouds, but it's hard to do this with entire novels. Um, it's a huge advantage over, uh, you know, state spaces and any other discipline, physics, biology, whatever, uh, mathematics. So I think that is a really interesting thing that uh, we can actually use the images as a sort of like, um, uh, you know, corrective basically integrating qualitative and quantitative in a really neat way. Mm. So yes, I, I, I find that is fantastic. And um, the key thing is there's many areas where this is obviously exactly like that also used. So I had a hard time during my PhD. I had this uh, thing, I, I used image matrices. So basically monument documentation, and you can actually, um, you know, there's a link between a book and a monument, and you can actually place the figure in the book at the location of the link, and that gives you these two-dimensional visual overview matrices. That's really hard to communicate in art history, but biologists do this all the time, <laughs> which is sort of funny, right? Like, mm. you have cell essays, and it was like, just look at nature, cell, and, and, and science. There's like a, an image matrix in every issue, typically small size, not very large, but, but still, the paradigm is there. And I think that is sort of something which is interesting that this sort of like back and forth between which of the, the, the subject, the quantification and, you know, the, the, you can go back and forth. So that is really, really cool. And I think there is probably um, many ways in many sciences where this could be harnessed a little bit more. Mm. Another part of your question, if I understand right, um, is, um, you know, how do we how do we sort of like you know, find safety in, 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 in positions. So one thing that people um, tend to forget is that if you, like, you know, I, I, I so here's my paradigm regarding this. Sorry, let me start from there. Like, my paradigm regarding this is like, you can learn how to ski. Uh, you can learn how to ski downhill, super G, uh, slalom. And then you get the right equipment and you're really good at that and you go into the regular sort of like uh, racing uh, kind of, um, um, you know, events and stuff like that. And you become really, really good at that. That is regular science, right? So, so you, you, you do a paper where you do 20 interviews and uh, you analyze it in some certain way and then write a paper. Or if you do, um, you know, something in computer science, you have an algorithm, you make it a little bit more efficient and you publish it in a journal where that does that kind of thing. While at the other hand, if you do really broad, true multidisciplinarity, obviously you also need to learn some basic uh, circumstances, but you're not maybe set in this common rule set. Mm. But you need to sort of know how nature works. So this is more like backcountry ski. You have a backpack, you have some food, something to drink, ideally a shovel, and, and then you, you, you trust your skills but you can do that because you know enough about the environment and enough about your body that you can actually do that. And I think there, one interesting thing is like, how can you do, go ahead and use network science in, in art history? So for me, this was a very natural thing. I've worked as a database consultant for large knowledge craft databases, and I studied art history and archaeology, looking at like 200 paintings in one seminar or whatever, right? So now the key thing is these two things sort of begged to become the same thing. They, they wanted to be together. But here I had 20,000 objects, here I had 200. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. I saw there is this weird frequency distributions, and all of a sudden I learned, oh, this could be studied like a network. And once that proof of concept, that was very risky during my PhD. But once that was established, now you know there's absolute safety in the fact to say take any cultural system and look at the complex network aspect. Yeah. If nobody has done this, this is sort of like a it's like easy cruising in the in the afternoon between coffee and dinner mm-hmm. because there will be complex network structure. Yeah. Similarly, right now these multidimensional vector spaces, we now are at a point where we can say, okay, this is a thing. And we can actually study that. And even if people uh, think you're crazy, like, let me give you one example. At the ERC, you have to decide for a panel. If you go to culture, cultural productions, and social science and humanities, it's very unlikely you will encounter a quantitative person, not even speaking of three quantitative people, uh, sort of like pushing your thing through. Hmm. It's very hard to find any other panel where you could actually say, oh, there are the specialists. Because complex networks doesn't even exist as a panel. Um, the people always have to decide if they do nonlinear physics or, uh, or condensed matter physics, which typically send these proposals back and forth. And so, right? so the kind of key thing is we have to build that from scratch. And I do think this is true for multidisciplinary hmm. in general. We have to actually sort of sense what are the emerging multidisciplinary things because there is 15% of us who do two disciplines, 15% of the 15% who do three, and there may be some who do many, many disciplines. And there must be a way how these things are funded because otherwise, you know, we lose a lot of opportunity for society to solve problems that very urgently need solving because in the end, everything is connected. and There's yeah. no way around it. Absolutely, yeah, well, I mean, Absolutely agree with that. Um, and just just to refine uh, and perhaps uh, finish with this, because um, I was because I, I love your answer in a in a very broad sense because it, it really touched on the important points. But I was thinking perhaps very specifically the fact that when when you study say the art history of painting, right? Mm-hmm. And I think there's there's a, as you said, it's a very nice circumstance that you can have a, an intuitive perception of the of the painting. But I was referring more to the fact that you can translate the data of the painting in, into a format that is computable, that is immediately computable, because in fact, a large portion of your of your body of interest is already in that format. Any digital art is already in that format, mm-hmm. right? Any visual digital art. So my question is, can you imagine, can you daydream speculate on how you would datafy uh, scientific production more more abstractly, more generally, because to me it sounds that to me that's the core problem that we don't have good metrics. I mean, it has to rely on oh yeah, this person has a good career. Look at all these credentials they had, all these publications, all these citations. This is all second order, in my opinion, right? <laughs> in, in, in some yeah. sense, what you're doing with art is first order in the sense that it's mm-hmm. looking at the output itself, and and I mean it's very high order analysis on a very first order thing that is there of the material itself. Whereas in science it's already second or higher order from the start because nobody, I mean, science is like, okay, this is good or bad because it does it mm-hmm. satisfies the conventions of the scientific method or not. But there's, it's very hard to judge what the thing in itself is when you are recognizing good or bad science. Mm-hmm. Any thoughts on mm-hmm. this? Yes, let me get something. Um, so, whoops. I think this should not be underestimated. It's a microscope. And so we are not studying first order art. If you stare at an artwork with a microscope, with UV light, with raking light, uh, in different lighting conditions, uh, with different preparations, meaning you have studied different things, you had a different life, completely different things happen. Mm -hmm. And the depth in which you can dive into an artwork is essentially infinite. If you look at Cezanne's paintings, you could basically say, give me 10 centimeters square and I just look at the brush structure, how different colors mix of how he does this. I don't know if somebody has done this. Mm. You could spend an entire career doing only that and only with Cezanne, I guess. So we actually have a section in this paper where we write that out. We say, okay, so here's the thing. We are not looking at artworks. We are looking at digital images 
and everybody in digital art history is aware of this, everybody in art history is aware of this, we're looking at digital images of very limited resolution, probably not even having the same color profile because ectochromes sort of, you know, in blue they do more or whatever. Mm. Um, at very limited resolution, we do something very similar to somebody who studies the history of art via, say, a set of 35 millimeter slides or a set of black and white paint, uh, black and white photographs in a textbook series or something like mm. that. So that's what we're doing. Yeah. But professional connoisseurs and art historians have worked the very same way, right? Like Berenson had like 30,000 photographs, black and white, this size. And that's how he sort of got the first overview of, of Italian Western painting. I think that is some, something that is super important, but we must not underestimate all the stuff that is still there and all the stuff that is not captured by what we're doing. For example, our method is not limited in principle, but our study is limited by that. Um, basically looking at the small resolution. And I think that is sort of something which um, fundamentally we end up in a very same situation. Mm -hmm. What we're doing right now is, and I, 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 I put in a paper, I pulled it out of the paper, it's not in there anymore, but I think the situation in which we're in is very similar to early human proteome research, like protein-protein interaction, where there was first a 5% map, then there was a 25% map, there was an 85% map, and at some point they got all of them. But So now here's one interesting take home for this. We don't know if there is a phase transition going on at 97%. We don't. And that is a really important problem. Same thing if you stare at the universe. We're in a similar situation where Fritz Zwicky looked at the, all the stars through an optical microscope with his wife, and both of them mapped the universe. Sort of yeah, they found neutron stars and uh, sort of postulated dark energy, super cool. But compared to what we have right now, it was basically super, super little. Mm -hmm. And I think that is very much what we're doing. We're, we, we're only scratching the surface. And I do not agree that what we do is first order. It's, we're, not, we're not getting anywhere close to the true resolution of art. Sure. Yeah, 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 no, I, I, I mean, I think I think I've, I, misuse the, the term first order in this context because yes. I, I was only yeah. referring to the fact so say that you want to restrict yourself to digital art even yeah. pixel art so you say okay my realm of analysis really is 120 by 120 pixels whatever right? yes. you, you do restrict yourself to that my point was more that the kind of techniques that you developed and the kind of analysis that comes out of your your talk and what you talk, told us today mm -hmm do paint a quite a, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done, obviously, still, but do, does paint an interesting uh, picture of, of what it looks like. I mean, things, phenomena that we are intuitively sort of aware of and, and then having some more quantitative grips on them, right? So so my, my point was that I feel that machine learning has a very good time with certain things like text or pictures mm -hmm. because we have data structures and machines that already process these things at a almost hardware level, right? Like to, So they are built to process this sort of data. And uh, I guess my question is very raw and general, so it's unfair that you're trying to reply in a sensible way, but, uh, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I guess I'm trying to think of how would you think that human intellectual production, this is a ridiculously <laughs> speculative question, but how would you think that human intellectual production could be datafied in a meaningful way that you could foresee sometime down the line applying the sort of techniques that you're, that you're applying to to sort of grids of pixels. So, so, so here's like why this Leibniz picture I think is so yeah. salient. And interesting. I was thinking so, of, of Leibniz when I said that. So, <laughs> so, so here's the thing about you know these 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 GPUs, which give us all these advances in machine learning, um, all contain little connection machines. Uh, which is this parallel computer, which uh, Denny Hill has used to sort of like then do knowledge graphs and stuff like that. So all these things sort of intertwined. <laughs> so it's not quite clear what was first. So do we structure images the way we structure them? And do we compute images the way we compute them? Because the computer um, can do it that way and is constructed in the way, or do we construct the computer because images are that way? So th th there's a, there's a, sort of uncomfortable sort of intertwining going on, mm. uh, which uh, if you look at uh, stare more at nature, we may find out that there is some uh, stuff happening. I think uh, one uh, neat little uh, uncertainty 
uh, that we it gives us maybe a hint of where sort of like we can correct um, our our procedures is that uh, digital computation is fundamentally super expensive. Yep. So thermodynamically, it, it, computers get hot very quickly. So somehow, um, you know, sort of like cognition in the living, to not say human, uh, seems to be much more efficient. Mm -hmm. And not even that, like even if you have simple annealing processes of like soap bubbles and stuff like that, right? So um, the optimum surface between wires is my favorite example. Like, you know, you take a, a, a bucket of soap, you, you bend some structure and wire, pull it and pull it out and you get the optimal surface in like no time and nothing gets warm. It's like sort of real annealing basically. If you do the same thing in a computer, computer gets warm. So there is obviously some out of syncness going on. George Dyson has this really neat sort of observation uh, that we used radio bulbs, which is an analog thing, to sort of like simulate digital processes. So, so in order to build digital computers, we sort of like abuse some analog process. Uh, and now at the end, we're now a digital, uh, we, we abuse digital computers to sort of model some analog process, which is what machine learning actually is. And so now th there, there's some very weird sort of like, um, um, sort of uh, not insufficiency but um how do you say it's 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 not it's not it's not optimized right so even though it is so quick and so fast and we can type uh, give me a lion who eats cherries uh, in a ferrari card like you know like the the neural network gives you a nice looking painting in the manner of whatever right but that there i i think we're we're, we're only at the beginning and uh, probably this is like my, I, I'm just convinced by that sort of mm. semi-spiritual. I think we should just stare more at nature. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm a firm defender of the analog versus digital uh, battle in computation. So completely agree with that. All right. So I see some people already saying goodbye. So I think it's a good point yes. to um, um, close this session. So this is the end of the week, but not the end of, of the conference, because obviously Tony had to cancel his talk and next week we'll have the, the workshop that will probably attach to Tony's session somehow. So for those uh, who are following the, um, the event live and they're joining the Zoom sessions, do keep an eye on, on, on your mailbox because we'll, we're going to send some follow ups. But otherwise, thank you so much, Max, for, for this session. It was amazing. I like, can, can I have a uh, last word? I want to I want to thank I don't know, it's like below me here. There's the Kudan Lab logo. Yeah, exactly. I, I want to thank my collaborators, Tallinn University, Estonia in general, the European Commission for making all this possible. Um, and also all my other collaborators who are spread across the world and all the people who um, sort of like, um, you know, sort of like collaborate loosely in the spirit of this, because I do think that research is not, uh, you know, yes, we do individual things, but without sort of like the village, this will never happen. Absolutely. And a lot of the work you have seen today is sort of not just coming out of my brain, but all the people who sort of like uh, have taken part in it. So thank you very much. And also thank you very much to the audience for the interesting questions. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you soon. Stay tuned. Goodbye. Thank you.